Hello, David Snowpick here from Snowpick Games, and this is part two in a tutorial series about implementing rollback netcode in a game built using the Godot game engine. Back in part one, we talked about what rollback and prediction is, how it works, why you might want to use it, and some of its pros and cons. In this part, we're going to actually create a game. In fact, we're going to create the simplest possible demo game that we will continue to build on for the rest of the parts in this tutorial series. We are going to use the Godot rollback netcode add-on, which is a reusable library that I created. It is open source, MIT licensed. Here's the GitLab project page. You can also find it in the Godot asset library. Just search for Godot rollback netcode. The Godot rollback netcode add-on includes all of the basics that you would expect, such as gathering input, saving and loading state, sending messages, detecting mismatches, and rollback support for many things you probably want to put in your game, such as timers, animation, random number generation, and sound. It also has some really sweet debugging tools, and these are all things that we will cover in this tutorial series. However, in this part, we're just going to be getting started. The add-on is used in at least one full game. Retro Tank Party is a game that I created. It is available on Steam and itch.io, and a couple of other folks have already started using the add-on as well. One last thing before we get started, you will be able to find the tutorial code on this GitLab project in the part two branch. I'm thinking about maybe creating different branches for each parts in this series where we are writing code, which will be most of the parts. All right. First things first, we need to install the add-on. This is a brand new project in Godot. The easiest way to install the add-on is through the asset library. So we click the asset lib tab up here. We will search for rollback, click on the Godot rollback netcode add-on, click download, and then install. Now the code is installed, but we still need to go to project, project settings, the plugins tab, and click the enable checkbox. I'll give you a quick overview of the things that this adds to the editor. If we go back into project, project settings, and the autoload tab, you'll see a new autoload singleton has been added called Sync Manager. This is one of the primary ways that our game will interact with the add-on. If we go into the general tab, there are some new project settings added under network rollback, some settings for the add-on. There are some new node types. If I go to add a new node, there is now network animation player, network timer, network random number generator. And the last thing is a new tool added under project tools log inspector, which is a debugging tool. Now we need to get our game clients connected. We use Godot's high level multiplayer API, which if you've never used it before, there's some great documentation here. But the short version is that it allows you to make remote procedure calls, RPCs. That means you can call a function on some node and it will actually execute on a remote client on the other computer. There are a few different backends for Godot's high-level multiplayer API. There is Enet, which is a semi-reliable layer over UDP, as well as WebSockets and WebRTC. Despite web being in the name, those are not limited to the web. You can use them just fine on desktop and mobile. However, for simplicity in this project, we are going to use Enet. Now, Enet is technically client-server, but if you only have one client, that's peer-to-peer. -peer. You have a server peer, a client peer, they're talking directly, and we're just going to make a two-player game. You can use Enet for more than two players. That would totally work, but the messages between the clients will actually be relayed through the server, which will add a little bit of latency. If you want to make a true peer-to-peer -peer game with more than two players, you need to make a mesh network. The only officially supported way to do that in Godot 3 is via WebRTC. That's what my game, Retro Tank Party, uses. In Godot 4, it will also be possible to make a mesh network with Enet, and I'm super excited about that. However, creating a mesh network is a whole bunch of extra work, and we are trying to create the simplest game possible. So we are simply going to use Enet with two players. First, we need to create a new 2D scene. We will rename the top level node main. We need to add some UI. Uh, so first we're gonna add a canvas layer. As a child of that, we will add a panel container, which we are going to rename connection panel. And as a child of that, we'll add a grid container. We'll go over and set the columns to two on that grid container. Now inside this grid container, we're going to add two labels, two line edits, and two buttons. 
All right, we're going to drag this connection panel over to the middle and resize it a little bit just so we can kind of see what we're doing. I'm going to rename this first label to host label and change the text to host colon. I'm going to drag up this first line edit right underneath it, rename that to host field and set the text to 127.0.0.1. That is the IP for localhost. I'm going to change the name of the second label to port label, its text to port colon, the second line edit to port field, its text to four nines, nine, 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 nine. I'm going to rename the first button to server button and the second button to client button. And we're going to set the text on the server button to server and the text on the client button to client. Now we're going to select all of the children of the grid container, go to size flags and click expand under horizontal. Then we are going to resize the connection panel a little bit to make it a nice comfortable size. Then go to layout and center. There's one more piece of UI we're going to add before moving on, and that is another label as a child to the canvas layer. I'm going to rename that message label. I'm going to go to layout and top wide and over to align and set that to center. This is just going to be a label for showing messages to the user. And let's save this scene, call it main.tscn. And next we need to add a script. So we're going to click on main go to attach script. We're going to delete all of the contents except for extends node to D. And I'm going to copy and paste the bits of code we're going to add so that you guys don't have to watch me type, but we are going to talk through every single line. So first we're adding a bunch of on ready vars where we're just assigning different nodes from the scene to convenient variables for connection panel, host field, port field, and message label. Then the first thing we want to do is go click on server button, taking us back to the 2D view, click on the node tab and double click pressed to connect a function to the pressed signal. And here we are going to set up uh, this client as an ENET server. And that looks like this. We create a new object of the type networked multiplayer ENET. We call the method create server on it and give it the port field. And the second argument, this one, is saying we only allow one client to connect because we're making this two player game. And then we assign that object to the network peer on the scene tree. Next, let's click on client button, double click on pressed, attach a new function to the press signal for the client button, where we are going to make it into an ENET client. And that looks like this. We also create a networked multiplayer ENET object, but this time instead of calling create server, we call create client, giving it the contents of the host field and the port field, and then assign that again to the network peer on the scene tree. Now there's a couple little UI things I want these callbacks to do also. We are going to, uh, in the server button pressed, callback, it's going to hide the connection panel and set the message label to listening dot dot dot. And in the uh, on client button pressed function, we're going to do something very similar. We're also going to hide the connection panel and set the message label to connecting dot dot dot. Now, in order to see if we've actually gotten connected, we need to connect to some other uh, signals. So we're going to implement a underscore ready function and connect to these different signals on the scene tree, uh, network peer connected, network peer disconnected, and server disconnected to these different callback methods, which we are going to implement now. So in on network peer connected, we're just going to set the message label to connected. In on network peer disconnected, we're going to set the message label to disconnected and then in on server disconnected, we are going to call back to on network peer disconnected, but just pass in the argument one. So basically this on network peer disconnected will be called on the client, or I'm sorry, on the server, and the on server disconnected will be called on the client, but we basically want them to act the same, but the server is basically just a special peer with the ID of one, so we call back up to there. Simple enough, I hope. Uh, let's save this 
and test it out. So I'm going to click the play button. Oop, we got to select a scene as the main scene. So I'm going to select the current scene. And in this client up here in this frame, I'm going to click server. And then I'm going to start another Godot instance down here. And in this one, I'm going to click uh, client. And you'll see they both say connected in the top. So these two clients are connected. Next, we need to set up the sync manager singleton to manage the session and the match. The first thing we need to do is to tell the sync manager about the peers in the session. So in on network peer connected, we need to call sync manager add peer with the peer ID. And then in on network peer disconnected, we need to do the reverse and call sync manager remove peer with the peer ID. Each match within a session should start by calling the start function and end by calling the stop function. However, the start function should only ever be called on the host. And the host is whichever peer has the ID one. On ENAT, that's always the server. With WebRTC, you just get to kind of make up the peer IDs, but we always need a host to do a tiny bit of coordination. The host isn't responsible for anything related to gameplay. They're not authoritative in any way. The gameplay is always evaluated independently on each client, but there are a couple of things that we need to coordinate or make sure only happen one time, and that is the job of the host. So when the peer connects, we need to call sync manager start, but we need to make sure we are only doing that on the host. So we use this bit of code. If get tree is network server, that determines that we are on the host. We set the message label to starting. Then we add a two second delay to allow sync manager to gather some ping data so that it can do a synchronized start with all of the clients. And then we finally call sync manager start. Now there's no gameplay currently in our game, so there is no natural way for a match to end. So we are just going to add a, a special button to end the match and leave the session entirely. So on the canvas layer, we're going to add a button. We're gonna name it reset button, change the text to reset, go to layout and put that in the bottom right. Then we're gonna go over to the node tab, double click pressed, to connect to the pressed signal. And we are going to add this code. So first we have sync manager stop. This stops the individual match. Then we do sync manager clear peers, which we don't need to do after every match, but at the end of a complete session, we do need to clear the peers. Then uh, we are getting the network peer, which is uh, this ENET, uh, network multiplayer ENET object that we created earlier. We are closing our connection. We're completely disconnecting. And then we are reloading the scene. Now, this is just a demo game. In a real game, you would do this in a much more sophisticated way, but this is fine for our purposes right now. Next, we need to find out that the uh, match has started or stopped. So to do that, we need to connect to some signals. The sync started and synced stopped signals on the sync manager. Those are right here. We add them to our ready function, which we're going to call on sync manager sync started and on sync manager sync stopped, which for our very simple, not quite yet a game, will just be this. When the uh, match starts, we'll change the message label to say started, and we don't do anything particular on stopped. Now, that's fine for when everything is working well, but what happens when there are issues, when there are errors? So we need to connect to a couple more signals. The sync lost and sync regained signal. Sync lost will be called whenever synchronization has been lost, and sync regained will be called if we've actually managed to regain synchronization. And the main thing we want to do on those signals is let the user know so they're not confused as to why the match has suddenly frozen for a moment. So we're going to go back to our scene here in the 2D view, and we're going to add another label. We're going to call this a sync lost label. We're going to change the text to regaining sync. We will click layout and put this in the top 
right corner so you can see it here and then we're going to hide it so that our script can show it so now we need to add the implementation for these two callbacks here and on sync lost we're simply going to show that label and on sync regained we're going to hide the label again Ooh, and to do this we need to uh, add a new on ready var so that we can easily refer to it there we go and that is fine for if we lose sync and manage to regain it but what if we completely lose sync and don't regain it well there is one more signal the sync error signal and its implementation so sync error gets passed a message this is a human readable message we are going to show it to the user in our message label it's going to say fatal sync error and then the message that we get back from the sync manager we are going to hide the sync lost label in case it had been showing like if sync was lost it's showing it and now it's fatally lost so we need to completely remove it then we disconnect from the match and clear out our peers so i think that is the bare minimum we need to set up sync manager so let's test it out up here i'm going to run the server down here i'm going to run another godot client as the client this one says starting oh and we went to started so there is nothing going on here because we have no gameplay yet but we can see a little bit of what is happening by adding another auto load uh, singleton so if we go into project project settings go to auto load and we uh, go to find this script within add-ons godot rollback netcode and sync debugger click add so what this uh singleton does is it adds a in-game networking overlay which can be activated by pressing f11 so let's do this again and let's look at the overlay so this one i made the server this one i'm making the client they get connected it says starting and now started if i hit f11 over on both of them you can get a little bit of information. So this shows that the server is connected to a peer with this peer ID. This is their RTT, that's round trip time. That's another way of saying ping, sending a message there and back. Uh, some lag and advantage calculations that we will talk about in a future tutorial part. But we can see that everything is actually working. There's just no, there's no gameplay yet. We are finally getting to the really interesting stuff, implementing the players. First, we need to create a new scene, a new 2D scene. We'll name the top level node player. We'll add a sprite node to it as a child. And because this is a Godot tutorial, you know what that sprite is going to be. It is going to be the icon.png dragged over to the texture here. And one last thing, we're gonna click on the player node, go over to the node tab and then groups. And we're going to add a special group called network underscore sync and add it. This group tells the sync manager that this node wishes to participate in rollback. And you'll see what that means in a moment. So we're going to attach a script here, player.gd, that's fine. We're going to clear out the code. And the first function we want to implement is this one underscore get local input that returns a dictionary. So this is one of many special virtual methods that will get called by sync manager on nodes that added the network underscore sync group this is the other primary way that our game is going to interact with the sync manager via these virtual methods so this first one get local input is getting the input for this particular node which uh, gets an input vector based on the arrow keys we create an input dictionary if the input vector is non-zero we stuff it into that input dictionary and return it now in the next special virtual method that we're going to implement that is underscore network process. This is essentially uh, our replacement for a physics process or process in a normal Godot game, except this is run on every tick, not every frame. So if multiple ticks need to be run within a single frame, this is going to get called multiple times. And it is passed uh, an input dictionary, which can either come from get local input or it can actually be predicted input. 
Now in this part in the tutorial series, we are not going to write our own custom prediction code. So it's just going to use the default, which is to copy whatever the input was for the previous frame. So we are getting that input um, and then doing our thing. We are adding that input to our position times eight. You'll notice that we are not getting a delta value. That is because we are doing everything in terms of ticks. The same thing needs to happen on every single tick. So if the delta is different, that is going to mess things up. Also, if you are very astute, you may notice that this is doing floating point math, which is not guaranteed to be deterministic. In this case, it probably will be if you're running the client and the server on the same machine and you're not connecting a gamepad where you're going to get like analog values here. Uh, if you're just pressing the arrow keys, this is going to do all whole numbers. It's probably going to be deterministic, but it isn't guaranteed to be. That's fine for this part. Uh, we're just trying to put together the simplest thing that could possibly work. In future parts in this tutorial series, we'll be talking a ton about determinism. So the last thing we need to add to our player script is these two virtual methods, underscore save state and underscore load state. So at the end of every tick, we are going to be saving our state. In the case of our very simple player scenes here, that is just the position. And then whenever we do a rollback, we'll be loading an old state from our state buffer and this load state virtual method will be called. And then we take that state and set it up on our scene. I think that's everything we need for the player script. The last thing we need to do, oop, we got to save this player.tcn, that's good, is we have to integrate these players into our main scene. So we're going to instance our player scene two times. We're going to name the first one server player and the second one client player. We're going to move the server player to be somewhere around here the client player to be somewhere over here, save that. And then we just need to tell the sync manager which peer is responsible for which player. And we're going to do that within our on network peer connected function. Let's copy in this little bit of code. So the, um, the way that we tell sync manager that a particular node belongs to a particular peer is we call this set network master uh, function with the peer ID. The server player is always going to be controlled by peer ID one. The client player is always going to be controlled by the other peer, but the way that we get that peer ID is different depending on whether we are the server or the client. So for the server, which we found out by doing this, if get tree is network server, uh, the peer ID for the other client will be what's passed in here as the argument to the on network peer connected. And if we are the client, then we get our own peer ID by calling get tree, uh, get network unique ID. So I think that's everything we need to make this actually finally work. So let's run it uh, up here. I will make this be the server down here. I will make this be the client. And once it says started, if I press the arrow keys on this one, it moves down there. And if I press the arrow keys on this one, it moves up here. So it seems to be working. Let's look at the network overlay. And if I move around, Ooh, we actually did get a rollback. I'm surprised. <laughs> but for the most part, we don't get rollbacks. And the reason we don't is because the RTT is so low, because these are both running on the same machine. Uh, one thing we can do is we can artificially introduce some latency. So I'm running this Linux command here that just adds 50 milliseconds of latency. You can see that reflected in the RTT up here. It kind of bounces between like 100 and 133. And now if I move uh, one of these players, you see that I get a whole bunch of rollbacks on the other uh, clients. And actually, if I move in like this sort of funny um, zigzag pattern, you can see quite a bit of artifacting. And in future parts in this tutorial series, we'll talk about ways to hide that artifacting. But that's it for today. That should be enough to get you started with the add-on. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments below or come over to the Snowbike Games Discord and me or the community there will be happy to help you out. 
In the next part, we will be making a custom message serializer. I know that probably sounds pretty mysterious right now, but I promise I will explain in the next part what that is, why you need to create one for your game. We will make one for our little demo game that we're working on today, as well as look at a more complex example from Retro Tank Party. I can't wait. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.